Good afternoon, colleagues. Welcome to the latest webinar from the National Youth Agency. Um, my name is Lee Middleton, Chief Executive of the NYA. It is my pleasure to be here this, this afternoon to uh, talk you through the latest changes to guidance as the uh, country moves formally to step two of the government's roadmap from Monday. Um, I'm joined today by, in the background by my colleague Amanda Fern, who is taking all your questions. So uh, please uh, put them in the chat and uh, use the, the, the YouTube uh, chat function and uh, post any questions that you've got in there. Amanda will, uh, as always, filter them through, look at the look at common themes, and after I finish the presentation, she'll present. She'll ask me those questions on your behalf. Uh, normally, it's done by the wonderful Abby, but she's on leave today, so um, we've got Amanda, our COO, helping today. So do do put your questions to Amanda. Um, also, my thanks to colleagues in the background, Alex and Laura, who are driving everything behind the scenes for us today. Um, so let me uh, let's get this moving. There we go. So. Um, Really good news. We have the government has confirmed last Monday, uh, well confirmed yes this week that from Monday the twelfth next week uh, we will be moving formally into step two of their roadmap, and, and this has a couple of implications for the youth sector. Um, most of the good, most for good to be fair, and and one that's a little more complicated, which we will just talk you through. Um, so we'll get into that as we go through. Um, as always. The guidance that the NYA provides is strictly for England only. Um, our colleagues in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have separate guidance, um, which they should be following. And if you work across borders, you need to work out wherever your activity is going to take place and follow the guidance for that relative nation. Um, NYA is the regulatory body for England only. So, uh, yeah, please, please make sure you keep up speed. OK. Um, also, if you're part of a national association, um, and there are a few of them on the screen here, um, you also need to look at the guidance that they will provide to you directly if they do so, um, which will be additional to the information the NYA has provided. I've been in contact with uh, a number of colleagues at a range of organisations nationally in the last week, um, and we've brought them up to speed with what we're going to be saying today. Uh, there will be a new version of the NYA guidance published today, or sort of an updated version. It's only got a, it sort of tells you the latest information. Uh, and, and we've provided a heads up to our, some of our national partners who have been able to update their own guidance. So particularly in Scouts and Girl Guiding, for etc., they will be, uh, you know, around about now able to update you as well. So uh, as I've just said, we've got new version of our guidance. Version 5.2 is being published around about now. Uh, it'll be on our website. Don't listen to this webinar first and then at the end go and download it. That would be great. Um, and, and in there, everything I tell you today will, will be captured in that document somewhere. And uh, yeah, again, if, if, if we haven't got it or your, your situation is so unique, uh, then we'll very happily help you if you contact us through our guidance email inbox, which is simply uh, guidance at nya.org.uk. Drop us an email there and we'll get back to you within uh, 48 hours or so or 48 working day or 48 yeah, hours. We'll, we'll get back to you quickly. Um, also, we often repeat, but uh, it's worth keeping on our website. The NYA's website has all the latest information. And if things changed in between webinars, then the website is your place to go. You can download all the latest guidance documents. You can access all the latest information. You will find that on our website. Um, and, and yeah, please do. Uh, last time round, everybody hit the website so quickly in one go that it that it fell over. Our website's quite old, and we've got a brand new web system coming in about three weeks' time. Whole new look, whole new set of functionality, a whole new offer for the youth sector. Um, so we were just trying to hold it together with string until we get to that point. So please bear with us if the website's a bit slow or or, or isn't there. It will come back up quickly. Um, it is just it's getting a lot of traffic, an awful lot more than it was ever designed for. So uh, the brand new system's on its way, and our team are working flat out to. Uh, get that ready and so one of the things i just wanted to touch on before we get into the detail of this is uh we're, we're conducting uh, guidance is probably the most important work that we've got underway at the moment but the next sort of we've not of equal importance work is what we're calling the national youth sector census we are undertaking a once you know in a 10-year process to map uh every every inch of youth provision that is available to young people from the faith sector the voluntary sector the local authorities um, even maybe commercial providers, if it's appropriate, uh, who work and deliver with, you know, provide services and support to young people. Um, and and so we, it's just like the uh, the national census, which you've all recently completed in terms of the population for the country, uh, we are looking to map the entire UK, uh, England landscape 
of the youth sector, you know, how people are funded, where they're operating, who they work with, all those sorts of things. And this will have a huge impact because it will enable us to work with funders and government and, and policymakers to, to be informed. And at the moment, the biggest problem we have when, when lobbying for change or presenting the issues and challenges that young people have uh, is, is the lack of data, the lack of information on who's out there, who's doing what and where they're doing it. Where And, and uh, the flip of that is, where is there no provision? Where is there a lack of support? Where is there skill gaps? All sorts of things that we need to understand. So we're undertaking a national census. This will actually kick off in about three to four weeks time formally, but um, we're asking you to check if your organization, your youth club, your project, your youth center is pre-registered. So we've gone through all lots of national databases, pulled out um, membership information, charity commission registration, company's house registration. And we've we've assembled a list of 16,000 organizations. And if you go onto our website, you'll find this, this image on, on the front page of our website. If you can click there, you can check our search function and see if your organization is pre-registered. And if you are, then when the census launches and it's a, a fairly big survey, um, then then you'll go straight to your inbox and we'll be able to communicate it directly to you. Um, if you're not registered, please click the button, fill in the form and submit your information and then you will be registered and you make sure you don't get missed. We must capture the full breadth and depth of the youth sector as part of this census. It's the biggest thing that's going to make a big change to young people. And the pandemic has had a massive impact on, on the sector, the young people's lives, the way we're responding to their challenges, and we must have better data for it. So the census is a huge million pound project. It's going to cost a fortune. It's going to take a long time to sort it through, but we need everybody's help. So please work with us and uh, go now, not now, but listen to this webinar, but after the webinar, later this afternoon, just check you're registered. And if not, enter your information, particularly if you work for a local authority because uh, local authorities are not registered with Companies House or Charity Commission. They, so your information is not automatically available, uh, unlike many others. So if you're working in a local authority context, please, please make sure you go and uh, check and uh, update our information for you. No more on that. Let's move on to the while well, you're all here, which is the government roadmap. So we've been through step 1A, we've been through step 1B on the 29th of March, and the government has now confirmed that on the 12th of April, we will move to step two. Um, Hopefully, in the future, we'll move to step three and step four. There are indicative dates. These are what we're often calling not before dates. Um, they could well slip backwards. They could well move. So far, we're on track. But um, as you've heard the Prime Minister and others talk quite um, a lot, if you saw his uh, presentation on Monday, there were a lot of ums and ahs around, you know, what might happen next, because they don't know what's happening in Europe, um, transmission rates, the vaccine process is starting to slow down a little bit. Hopefully that picks up again shortly. Um, and, and these things may cause us to delay step three and step four. But for now, and what we're going to focus on today is step two, which we are ready to go for. So the good news is, um, before we go down there, before we move into either of the steps in the future, please do check the, the guidance that we've published and do not book or commit to any financial spend towards any activities um, that you may lose if the government has shifted their deadline. So in the future, we hope for residentials. In the future, we hope for more activities to be allowed. But we don't want anybody committing cost, you know, your, your scarce you know, really valuable budgets um, to activities that might get cancelled because you may not get that money back. So please be very careful. But once it's all confirmed, once we're really clear, just like now, we know that um, from Monday we'll be able to do more things. Once you know that and that's confirmed, then then please go and, you know, organise things that within the rules. But just be really careful. We don't want the sector to... to uh, take an unfortunate hit because the government has to move a date at last minute and it has happened in the past so let's just be careful so step two we'll be remaining in amber and uh, this will kick in from monday the 12th of april next week not before so everything you're currently doing this week you need to continue to do for the rest of this week this only takes effect from one minute past midnight on monday morning and uh, you need to be aware of that so um Key things to note. Yep. So our online and virtual youth work, youth sector delivery is is absolutely fine, and we'll be allowed under step two. We'll be able to conduct detached and outreach work. Um, there's one some slight tweak with the detached or outreach, and I'll come on to that in a little bit. But it is you know absolutely fine to continue to engage young people outside of buildings, in the community, parks, streets, shops, wherever you find them. That's not a problem. And we're able to provide one-to-one -one support for all young people indoors who who need it. 
The big change at step two that I'm sure will be incredibly welcomed is trips and visits are now permitted where appropriate. And I've got a slide around the appropriate component. So it's not that quite, it is straightforward, but let me talk you through it in a minute. So we'll come back to this issue. But from step two, we are allowed to go for day trips. We are allowed to go out for the day. We're allowed to go and visit things. That is not a problem. Now, what has happened is there is now differences in the regulations and the legislation for under 18s and over 18s. So if you work with over 18s, um, then, then please pay close attention to this because uh, there's good news for under 18s. For over 18s, it's not really much change at this point. So youth provision for under 18s and the definition of an under 18 year old is somebody who was 18 um, before the 31st of August 2020. So if they if they uh, were eighteen prior to that, then then you're fine. If they just if they turned sorry if they turned eighteen after the thirty first of August, then uh, you're uh, then they're, they're still classed as under eighteen by law. Um, every thirty first of August, so in twenty twenty one this year, um, the year will click forward. So uh, you know trying to keep young people in year groups specifically. So if they were started their year group as a seventeen year old and have now become eighteen, then they're still classed as an under eighteen for the purposes of this guidance. Um, I'll cover that again later on when we get to the questions because I hope I haven't confused people. So for youth provision for under 18s, we're allowed to operate indoors and outdoors, open access for all young people. So uh, previously we had you had to be vulnerable or you had to meet certain tests in terms of you know, you're helping your parents go to work or have a medical appointment. All of that is now gone. Very straightforward for us. If it's for delivery for under 18 year olds, indoors or out, then it's open access for all young people. Drop-in provision can now recommence. They do not need to be pre-registered. You do not need to be vulnerable to be able to attend. Any young person can to attend youth sector provision. Uh, fairly straightforward. But the better news, or even more news, is um, the legislation has changed that there is now no limitation on group sizes. So there's no requirement for under 18s to be in bubbles of 15. But we are asking you to consider keeping groups as consistent as possible. And you know, obviously your groups need to be appropriately sized for, for, to be best practice. You need certain ratios of staff, numbers of workers to young people, volunteers to young people, et cetera. Um, you know, just opening the doors and allowing hundreds through the door when you've only got two staff is unsafe. So you wouldn't do that. But um, we will no longer require you to put group young people into bubbles of, of you know, as we have done for a while. Um, and so you could open a youth club and if you've got the space to have 50 in the door, you could do. There are some challenges because things like social distancing, et cetera, are still in place. So you're going to need to think about the capacity of your venue and how you're going to operate this. But the two headlines for under 18 year olds uh, is that indoors and outdoors open access provision for all young people is go and no limitation on group sizes. Although be, be careful about, you know, consistency. For over 18s, um, not a lot has changed in a sense, and the, the law is really clear about under and over, the children, which, the, which we will class as under 18 young people, and adults, which is obviously over 18s. And because adults, you know, captures all sorts of support sessions and groups um, for young people, for, 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 you know, in our context, young people, but, you know, could be OAPs group, groups meeting up, could be Alcohols Anonymous, you know, Weight Watchers, whoever, um, those groups can still meet over 18, but we have to stick to our support group process. So that is by invite only. It is indoors or outdoors for vulnerable young people only. Uh, and it is for maximum of 15 young people per group, plus staff, plus volunteers, plus carers. I should say, you can have more than one group inside if you've got a space to have separate rooms, etc. In the for your over 18s, but we've got to be really clear: there is no change from what we're currently doing. I guess for our over 18s, support groups are fine, maximum of 15 young people per group, uh, but and that applies indoors as well as outdoors. Now the one twist is the rule of six is back. So um, if if it's a if it's part of an organised structured youth sector activity, so you've got a support group and you've invited young people along, you've planned a session, then you can operate indoors or outdoors with a maximum of fifteen young people plus staff, etc. If it's more of an ad hoc process, so you're going, you know, detached work, you're out on the streets, you're walking around, bumping into people. Um, it's not an organised or controlled or structured session. Well, then the rule of six will apply to all provision for those over 18 um, years of old age. And the, the thing to also remember is that rule, that grouping of six now also includes staff. 
So you're not allowed to be out in public, in a park, outside the shops, um, in a group of more than six adults. Um, and that includes your workers as well. Now, I should say, as detached youth workers, you, if you're out on, on out doing your thing, doing your job, uh, and you bump into a larger group, you are classed as a worker by the legislation, and the legislation allows you to go and engage and do your job. So, um, you know, you're protected in a sense from, from the rule of six side of things. But, you know, we've got a job to make sure that young people know the rule of six applies and, uh, you know, to make sure that we are counting ourselves when we're in groups, uh, because that is best practice and what we need to be doing. So that's your two differences. Under 18s, much more freedom, open access, drop-in provision, uh, and no limitations on group sizes. However, for adults and over 18s, um, the restrictions remain at this point as well. So vulnerable young people, maximum 15, and the rule of six will apply if it's not an organized or structured activity. Right, a few things just to pick up. So. Um, Finally, local day trips are and visits are now permitted. And I just wanted to cover a little bit about this. So really clearly, though, yes, they can take place, but do they need to and should they? And I think that is something you need to consider quite carefully. And, and our challenge to you is trips and visits should only take place if planned outcomes cannot be achieved through other means. So just because we've not been able to go out and we're desperate to go on a trip, do, you know, if you can achieve the same learning and the same development outcome without going on a trip, you should consider very carefully whether you need to do it or not. If the only way to achieve your goal or your outcome is to do a trip, then go for it. You know that you are welcome to do that and, and the rules allow it. But we've, we've got to be very careful. There is still the virus in community. We are, we've, we're aiming for the youth sector to be super, super responsible. And uh, we need to lead by example and be demonstrating as a sector that we are, you know, trustable and caring and careful with, you know, young people's health and the health of our staff and volunteers and the community at large. So trips can take place, but really carefully consider, do you need to do them? And, and they should be as minimal and as short as possible and, and only take place if really, really needed. However, we've had lots of questions in the, in the, from the last webinar and on our e email box around the travel arrangements for these sorts of things. So you can travel by minibus, by taxi, you can go on public transport, buses, trains, etc. You can go in cars. None, all of that is absolutely fine, but you need to take in consideration um, hygiene, face coverings, and, and the basics around being COVID secure. We'll come back to this a little bit in a bit. But um, so you can you can fill every seat in the minibus. Um, but if you can fill half the seats and have a gap between people, that is obviously preferable. Young people over 11 years of age would need to be wearing a face covering. Hand sanitizer needs to be liberally applied if it's safe to do so. And they're not, you know, that's that, that, that's a good thing to do. Um, and, and, you know, we've got to be careful around that social distancing. If anybody is unwell or needs, you know, then, then they shouldn't travel with you. Uh, Free community lateral flow testing is available, uh, and so you know, maybe I would we would recommend that you uh, you know apply, go down to your local community testing centre. You can pick up boxes of lateral flow tests, test everybody before you go. Therefore, you know you know your group as best you can care you know care for. Then they are safe. So you know you're safe to go away and do your trip. Trips are for one day only, and and they are neat. And the reason we're saying local is because you can't travel eight hours there and then travel eight hours back. Uh, because you know that's not that's not a day trip. So keep it keep it really careful, local, and, and keep it as short as possible to achieve the same outcomes. So your COVID, your standard COVID secure measures need to remain in place. So your face coverings, hygiene, and social distancing where possible. Now we accept when you're in a bus or you're you know or, or a car, you know there are only so many seats. They are placed where they are placed. You will have to manage that review your risk assessments be very careful about how you uh, consider your, uh, your your how you're going to plan your activity and look at what you want to do and, and if the risk is too great or you can't manage it effectively then then do not do it um, but the guidance has changed and yes trips and visits are now permitted now one of the things that we want to be really careful on is if you're going to a third party's venue um, then then that organization may have additional requirements that you must follow so um, if you wanted to go, if you were just going to uh, a DV expedition and you were going to go to the, 
go to the Lake District and go for a walk around for a day and then come back, you know, that will be fine because that's in the public open spaces. But if you were going to go to a bowling alley or, or you know, for example, and the bowling alley may be following slightly different rules once they reopen uh, and they may require groups of six. And so you may only be allowed groups of six individuals to go at a time and you will need to follow their rules and, and, and saying, oh, well, the youth sector can do this, this, and that, you know, could do other things doesn't wash, it doesn't work. You've got to follow the venue's guidance. The same will apply if you want to go to sort of museums or any sort of public venue, theatres, etc. They will have their own regulations, their own guidance they're following, um, and, and you will need to comply with both bits of that, what the youth sector allows you to do and what the venue will allow you to do. So please be careful about that. Oh, we have had some venues ring me up saying, oh, you know, we've got youth groups who want to do X, Y and Z, but we're not allowing it. And I've backed them up. They, you know, they, they should stick to their guns. They've got their regulations. We've got ours. We will follow the rules. And, and clearly, no overnight residentials or stays are allowed. We are looking at this carefully and we will continue to review. Uh, we hope from step three that uh, that's the point where um, camping certainly and, and other sort of overnight residentials will be permitted. But at the moment, they are not allowed. And so visits need to be local. Um, you can cross borders. You can go to the neighbouring town or down the road. You can go, you know, up the M4 for a bit. Um, but you shouldn't be going, you know, miles and miles and miles. These trips should be local and they should be for as short as time as possible. So that's the kind of key things for step two. I'll just update you all around step three. So step three is, is slated to kick in around the 17th of May. This could be delayed, of course. Uh, but well, everything we've talked about in step two is expected to continue. You know, we 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 would hope we're not having to go backwards. Uh, that's our expectation. So everything that's in step two, we we'll, if there's the need for bubble sizes or things like that, we will confirm that um, prior to the 17th of May. Particularly, you know, the over 18s groups of 15, etc. You know, if that rule is changing and it's for open access for all ages, then you know that wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, we will update you ahead of the 17th. And hopefully by the 13th, by the 17th, we're expecting UK residentials to be permitted. You know, uh, so no international travel, but the ability to uh, travel and stay overnight in the UK. There may well be quite tough restrictions on what that might look like, the type of accommodation you can use. That you know, there may be additional restrictions that we have to put in place. Um, that's simply to follow the rules, simply to follow the legislation or Public Health England guidance on concerns around virus transmission. Hopefully. It'll be a very different story. And when we get in a month's time or so, when we get to that point, we'll be uh, we'll update you. Just to reiterate, please do not go booking activities like residentials and things until we're absolutely clear it's going to be allowed and uh, what those what the framework that you can do that safely looks like. So just to reiterate, I won't labor that point. Step four, again, slated for the 21st of June. And this will be everything that we've talked about that's allowed at step three. But hopefully international travel is permitted, although there's lots of stuff in the media around, you know, don't book summer holidays until 2022. So um, it, it could well be that international travel isn't going to be allowed for a while. We don't know. We just don't know. And as soon as we do, we will, of course, update the sector. And again, if there's still need for group sizing, then we will update and uh, see how that goes. But uh, hopefully not. So just to reassure you around COVID safe measures, we've got to make sure we continue and stick with rigorously the COVID secure and COVID safe measures that we have in place. So just to reiterate, you know, leaders and workers are not included in support group numbers, you know, 15 young people plus staff for over 18 provision. Um, the use of face coverings, good hygiene and social distancing continue for all ages, indoors and out, and will need to be uh, followed. So outdoors face coverings are not required unless you are within uh, you know, two, one metre or two metres of each other. But if you're spread out, that's not a problem. But we should be washing our hands regularly, you know, our hands, face and space, it still applies. And we need to be staying one plus metres apart from each other, indoors or outdoors, at whatever age. Those rules have not uh, evaporated. So we've got to stick to, you know, if you're over 11 and, and it's appropriate and safe to do so, face coverings, as so, so should staff be wearing those. Hygiene is required. You know, hand washing, keeping, a, you know, touch points if there's areas that people are using all the time, uh, that cleaning, cleansiness needs to be absolutely uh, still remain as rigorous as ever. Just because we're allowed more, more in the building, we've probably actually got to up our game around hygiene and cleaning the building. We've probably got to be better at this stuff than we have been. So uh, think that through very carefully. 
Social distancing will also continue um, and we'll have to, that could be around for quite some time. Uh, so we should be getting used to that. You can still provide back-to-back -back sessions. We, I mean, this probably goes without saying, but um, you know, if if you're operating one group, then you want to run run a second one an hour later. You can do. You need to clean the building still in between. Uh, it can be run by the same members of staff. It can be run. You can run things across multiple days of the week. None of that's a problem, but we've just got to be following our COVID our COVID secure steps. And again, um, the community and public venues can be open for the purposes of providing support groups and activities. There is still some venues that will not be allowed to open um, under, under step two. But for the youth sector, if it's if it's a community venue, a youth centre, a scout hut, a village hall, and it's for the purpose of providing access to our youth clubs or youth projects over and under 18s, then, then they're absolutely right and allowed to open by the law. So, um, you know, do use your venues. Um, the use of private dwellings for the avoidance of doubt must not be used in any circumstances. It's not acceptable to be running sessions in people's kitchens or gardens. It's not acceptable. However, at step two, home visits for young people are now back and that can be can be done. They should be considered a minimal and a last resort. But uh, if there's a need to visit some, some very high need young people who I know have anxiety and need our support, then you can go and visit them at, at home uh, as long as that's following all the usual sa appropriate safeguarding measures and uh, you know hygiene, et cetera. So let's make sure we've got all our COVID secure measures in place. This is the eight tests that you need to make sure you're following. So, um, you know, your action plans are really going to need to be reviewed now. You could have more young people in, you could have different types of activities taking place. So a, a strong review of your action plan is going to be needed before you reopen. Don't throw the doors open on Monday just because you can. If you haven't done the homework and the planning and the review of your action plan, you must do that first. Risk assessments need to be updated, <clears throat> reviewed. There could be different risks because you've got more young people and doing different types of activities. Trips and visits could be out, could be happening. So really carefully reviewing your risk assessments um, and, and taking a, a fresh look at those would be really, is really, really important. Groups and bubbles, you know, just because you can open an under 18 youth project without needing to put young people into groups and bubbles doesn't mean that's the most responsible thing to do. And actually, if, if keeping young people in consistent as possible groupings is achievable, then you really should be considering that. And the reason is, you know, what we're trying to do is keep young people in consistent group between their school day and their evening activities or their weekend activities and, and, and in consistent groups between week to week. So if you can operate in a consistent way, then you really we should be. And that is highly recommended. Um, but, but as I say, for under 18s, um, you know, there are no requirements around group sizes any longer. Hygiene and hand hygiene is in particular is, is incredibly important. Washing our hands, using soap, using hand sanitizer, it needs to be extremely rigorous and, and repeated throughout your session and throughout the, the day. Um, you know, if people are touching things, moving around, doing activities. Every time they do a different type of activity, they should be washing their hands. You know, hand hygiene needs to increase. And if we want to keep this virus at bay, we've got to do our part in, in, in really upping our game around hygiene. Keeping your venue clean. We've talked before about equipment, et cetera. So, you know, if cooking, um, you know, you shouldn't be handing a frying pan between three young people. Only one young person should be using the frying pan. When they're finished, it should be washed soap and water before it's given to the next young person to use keyboards and computers you know if you've got a computer suite um you know the keyboard needs to be sprayed down and wiped down with an alcohol wipe or something prior to the next person using that keyboard and mouse it's that kind of stuff that we've got to be really really careful on and, and you need to be you know thinking through in your action plan how are you going to manage these ex these requirements because you, know, you may have more young people in your venue now than we're used to for a while and you know this is brilliant but we've got to be really really careful door handles touch points toilets all those things are going to need to be cleaned really really clearly and and regularly and and, and during your session if, if necessary particularly if it's a busy one Face coverings are still going to need to be worn. That none of the none of the rules around face coverings have adjusted at all. So, if a young person is 11 and over, and that includes your staff, your volunteers, uh, and uh, if they're not ex having a, a valid exemption, then they need to continue indoors to wear face coverings. Outdoors, if they're within um, a meter or so of each other, then they should continue to wear face coverings. Under 11s can still wear face coverings. It's not the law doesn't require it. It's still recommended, but you know it isn't necessarily uh, going to be. It's not compulsory. 
And, and our social distancing requirements are exactly the same as before. So just because you could have 40, 50, 60 in the building, you've still got to spread them all out one metre plus two metres apart, ideally. So that might put a limitation on the number you can have through the door. And actually, if you've not got the big enough space to have lots of people spread out, then, um, you know, then, then you're going to need to limit the number that can come. And, and that's just, that might be the limitation. It's not that the bubble size is set by us, but you'll be setting your own you know, group bubble sizes, because that's the maximum your venue can hold. And you'll need to think that through quite carefully. Um, you can have multiple groups in different spaces and you can share toilets and kitchen spaces as before. Um, again, cleaning things very thoroughly, always important. And finally, the NHS test and trace um, app, the QR codes, etc., should be used and is encouraged to be used where appropriate uh, for over 16 year olds. So please, please take a note of that. So that's they're the key things we need to be doing. Um, we've got our guidance website, so you know, please, if you want to catch up on any of this, you can follow this YouTube video. Um, it'll be it's broadcast live, but after the event, you can watch it back, and please do so. Um, please, while you're on our YouTube channel, please give us a, a thumbs up, give us a like if, if this is useful to you, uh, and if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please go on there and also subscribe. Uh, that way, you get all the latest information through our YouTube channel when we publish new content. So the government's asked us to remind everybody around their key messages of washing hands, covering face and making space. I've probably said that enough. Um, there is separate guidance still for detached youth work and this guidance is still relevant and current. So if it's useful to you, please go and take a look. You'll find it on our website. The youth work support website is still up and running and uh, has been added with extra resources more around organizational resilience now as we come out of the end of this pandemic, hopefully, you know, it's had a big knock on our ability to operate to our balance sheets, our finances. So there are additional tools and resources and support for trustees and managers and workers who lead organisations alongside all the stuff we've had before around activities for young people, support for youth workers, etc. Um, you'll find all the templates for action plans, risk assessments, all of that is on the Youth Work Support website if that's useful. And huge thanks to our partners uh, who've worked with us on that. Um, the final plug for me around our Roots to Success programme, we ran a programme of 15 technical specialist webinars on key topics, you know, serious youth violence, young people's employment, reflective practice and supervision, something that's probably not happening enough in the world. And so, you know, go to our YouTube channel, have a look at the uh, watch list for our Roots to Success programme. They're about an hour long, some of them are a little bit longer because they were more detailed, um, but really worth going and having a watch and, and up, you know, getting brushing up on your, com your thoughts and reflections on these issues. Uh, if it's useful to you, please go and have a look at our Roots to Success. And then my final plug for our census, this is the big one, the, the after, after guidance, understanding what you're doing, how you're doing it and who you're doing it with will help us and help, you know, sector, national bodies and organisations, lobby government, work with funders, look at how we can, you know, target resources, focus our energies to help, you know, rebuild the youth sector and, and secure more resource and support for youth work, young people and amplify the voice of young people. So again, please go onto our website and just check your organisation for now is registered. That means you're ready, ready when the when the census kicks off. So that's it. So that's the key quest, that key stuff from myself. Um, I'm going to invite my colleague Amanda to come in at this point. Amanda's been watching in the background and hopefully you've put all your questions into the chat on, on YouTube and she's been watching those and then Amanda can, uh, can put those questions to us and uh, yeah, we can go from there. Amanda, are you there? I am indeed. Hello. Hello. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody, for your questions. Um, Lee, I think you were right. There's a there's some that need clarity around the over and under 18. Um, we've also got a number of questions relating to social distancing. So if we start with um, the first question, which was around um, if, a, if you've got a group which is over 18, but is still classed as young people, for example, that they're un under 25, but with disabilities, what applies? there yeah so that 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 unfortunately it's their it's their um, biological age that that, if, that that affects there so um if you're 20 over over 18 with special needs uh, you are still classed as an over 18 year old and an adult and and therefore the the um support group process applies maximum groups of 15 plus your staff plus your workers etc um, and the next one relating to that is the confirmation around the under 18s don't have to be in bubbles of 15. So the, 
there's been a question asked around whether that sort of contradicts what the out of school settings guidance says. So if you could add some clarity for us around that. Yeah, so they should be pretty similar now. Um, so the, the guidance that we've got is that um, if you're working with under 18s, then there is no requirement for bubbles and there is no requirement for the size of a group that you have other than what your venue and your best practice allows. Um, the same sort of community support for children, you know, can meet in the park, community support starting up again uh, without group size limits. The same applies to, to the youth sector. Um, it should be pretty consistent. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other one that comes up um, is around the mix of groups. So where we've got under 18s and over 18s, what's the advice in, in terms of how we manage that? And um, one particular question asked around where parents and carers are engaged in that provision as well. So any any guidance on how those get managed, please? Yeah, let's, let's take those two slowly. So um, if it's a mixed group with under and over 18s, unfortunately the over 18 rules apply to your session. So the law, or, or, so it's either all under 18s and then it's open access and, and no requirements to follow any of those sort of rules. Or, but if there is adults in, adults in the group, then, then, then the whole group has to follow the adults process, the over 18s uh, process. So invite only, support groups, et cetera. Um, and, and that's quite frustrating. And it's one of the areas that we've pushed quite hard, you know, we have pushed back in the past on government, um, but the, the government, and I think this is a challenge that we've got, and I'm not sure we're gonna win in, before this pandemic concludes, but th there's a very clear line in, in law on, on so many acts of parliament around under age children, and a ch you're a child until your 18th birthday and then adults which is from beyond your 18th birthday and and the government is and the lawyers are sticking very rigidly to to that definition and so if you have a mixed group then uh, you need to be following the over 18 requirements um, you can still have more than one bubble or one one support group uh, in your venue but you know they've got to be in a fixed group of 15 and the two should not be mixing etc um, it is frustrating, but that is how it is. Um, hopefully, by step three, we'll uh, be allowed to lift that, but we're not sure yet. Um, Amanda, what's the other part of that? Um, it was around um, parents within... Oh, yeah. So, um, so parents and carers... Um, so, if you have a group, so if it's a special needs group and you've got 15 young people, <clears throat> and staff, key workers... Uh, volunteers are in addition to to that group so if you have parents attending <clears throat> uh, they are there as a carer and therefore they would not be included in your 15 um, and that would be fine um, it you know often parents might drop them off stay for a little bit and then go I wouldn't be worrying about that bit too much but if they're staying throughout the whole session they are classed as a key worker they are the carer the primary carer for that young person um, <clears throat> when I've run um, SEND projects in the past you know we had Parents had to stay on site to do uh, certain hygiene requirements, taking the toilets, etc. They are there as a key worker, as a carer. They are not there as a participant. That is your difference. So, if your young person is the participant, then any additional volunteers or staff are extra to that. Again, if that group is getting too large uh, and there's lots and lots of people, then you should look at splitting that into two groups and having two separate spaces to operate in, ideally. Okay. And just for absolute clarity, Lee, could you just um, repeat when they have to? be deemed 18 from what point? Yeah, so it's based on the school year. So if they started their school year when they were um, 17 and they then turned 18, then after the 31st of August, then then they are still classed as an under 18 year old until actually be the 9th, then the, the 31st of August this year. So it's, it's the point at which they transferred from being a 17 year old to an 18 year old. And uh, if they were within the school year, then you then they remain classed as an under 18 year old. So the date is the 31st of August, which is the cutoff for that. OK, thank you. Um, as to be expected, lots of questions around social distancing, always yeah. pretty tricky when working with young people for, for social distancing. Um, but to reiterate some of the, the guidance around that, one of them uh, the points that's come up on a number of questions is around the one metre, two metre rule. So um, whether it's one metres or two metres, and if it is one metre, is that written anywhere? There's a guidance uh, that people can be in that. Um... Sure, so it's in our guidance that you should be at least a metre apart and ideally two. So the law and the legislation is um, social distancing needs to be one metre plus, I think is what everyone always refers to. So um, not less than one metre, ideally two or more. Uh, and that, that, that's the follow. It's in our guidance document. It's in the uh, COVID secure section. 
it's in the group section and in the bubble section, which we've left in there. We've changed it slightly, but we've left that section in there because it still applies to your over 18s, etc. So, um, yeah, no, no, it's so it's both in a sense. So minimum of one meter, but a meter more is what you're aiming for. Um, ideally, at least two. OK, thank you. Um, and another one around masks um, that if young people are wearing masks, do they have to keep them on the entire time that they're within indoor provision and or can they become static if they're working two metres apart? Can you give us just a little bit more on, on that, please? Yeah, none of these rules have changed for face coverings. So if a young person's wearing a face, a young person needs to wear a face covering all the time when they're indoors, if they're over 11 years of age, um, unless they're exempt for some reason, and um, they can only remove it to eat, drink, or for sort of a team sport. So if they're running around a sports hall, it can be removed. Um, but beyond that, they should be wearing it continually, um, just as you would if you go to Sainsbury's or the shops. You know, you have to put a face covering on. Those rules have not changed. So young people need to follow the same, as do staff. And I think one of the things I really want to stress is staff also need to be wearing face coverings. That's not uh, not optional unless they, they have a good exemption or a reasonable exemption. Okay, thank you. Um, and I suppose um, the other question around that is the sharing of equipment. I, I guess this is another best <clears> practice that um, is it okay for young people to be sharing equipment if people are taking the steps to clean it in between use? Yeah, so you can share equipment um, in between use. That's not a problem. But you you shouldn't, you can't have multiple people using the same equipment at the, at the same time. So the example we've given on these webinars in the past is basketball. You know, you can't be bouncing a ball around, throwing it between 12 people on a basketball court because that's 12 people all picking, you know, all picking their nose, licking their hands, touching things. Uh, and, and sh you know, that ball is sharing the virus around. So between that ball sh being moved between people, it needs to be cleaned. Um, the same applies if you're doing cookery or art or any kind of activity that needs um, equipment in some shape or form. Uh, between, you know, handing that piece of equipment between people, then um, then it needs to be cleaned. Uh, the, the example that's often quite challenging is uh, registration. You know, if, you, if young people normally tick themselves in, you can't just have a pen on a table with a clipboard uh, because every time a young person picks it up, they could be picking up the virus from the last person. So they need a pen each. Or you've got to wipe that pen down before the next person uses the pen. It's probably a lot easier to have one person there just ticks everybody off. But it's the same sort of mentality needed to be taken into consideration that we're not sharing equipment, utensils, you know, cutlery, mugs, keyboards, mice, whatever it is, sports equipment, um, power tools. I don't know, whatever took for when I did a project did carpentry stuff, you know, you wouldn't be handing chisels between groups of young people if you're making stools and things unless you're... Uh, you know, being very careful around it. They have to be cleaned thoroughly between uh, each individual. Okay. And really just following on from that, if there's um, <clears throat> if there's multiple rooms that are being used for provision, um, are young people okay to move between rooms as long as they're being socially distanced or do they need to remain in one static place? Yeah, so uh, again, under 18s can go between rooms. Um, and there's no, it's, it's, it's open access now. So, you know, you can operate multiple spaces, young people can move between multiple spaces. Um, I think really best practice is, you know, hand sanitizer or something or washing their hands between rooms. So if they're going to be moving around, that they're keeping their hand hygiene high. Um, really tedious, I know, but, you know, that's, that's really good practice. Um, over 18s need to be in a fixed support group that don't mix with other groups. So they need to remain in a, either in a space. But if you've got a whole youth centre, um, you know, and you've got a group of 15 young people uh, over 18 in it, then they could move around the whole building quite comfortably. You don't have, that's not a problem. Um, it's just about shared contact points is, is the concern. So, yeah, no, for under 18s, you can move around the building. Uh, we would just recommend, you know, good hand sanitisation as young people transition from one activity to the next. Um, and just in relation to the, the face coverings, it's really difficult, isn't it, when you're, you're trying to think about the, the things that we'd be doing. So it's one of the questions is asking that if face coverings can be removed for indoor sports, can they also be removed for other physical activities like dance and drama? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's probably OK. Um, but again, make sure you're two metres apart. Like if you're two metres apart and you've got the windows open, so there's good ventilation, then, then that will be fine. I think the legislation talked about team activities and team sports. So you are focused, you know, the example that everyone's always used is been kicking a football around a sports hall, um, or, you know, then, then it's fine to, 
to remove face coverings for team activities and team sports. Um, dance and drama, similar types of activity. Uh, I think that would be okay. But you know, you must make sure people are one or two meet, one to two meters apart minimum, and wearing face, you know, and and good hand hygiene. Uh, we've got to really educate people around this stuff. Now yeah. we're getting really good at this. The youth sector is brilliant at this now. I mean, by gosh, we're a year in. You, you know so so many talented and incredibly dedicated colleagues out there who are on this call who are doing amazing stuff and i'm probably teaching you to suck eggs but i just we keep repeating these things because it's so important and uh, nobody can accuse us of, of not trying to help yeah okay and the um other ones that have, have come up is just this um definition of local um what mm -hmm. do we mean by local for day trips so can you cross county borders is there a definition of local yeah no there isn't a definition of local a local is something the MYA is um, put into the guidance um, it's not necessarily in the regulations if you wish um, and it's simply that you need to be doing it you know we activities should only happen if they really need to and, and you should go as short a distance as possible the reason being is if you're all in a minibus you're only in that minibus in that space for as minimal time as you can be so um, it, that you can cross boundaries, you can go into different towns, you can go up, you know, down the motorway half an hour or something. You know, those sorts of things are fine. Um, but what we shouldn't be doing is getting in the bus from London, trek, you know, trekking all the way to Pembrokeshire or something for the day in, in Wales and then trekking all the way back at the end of the day. That is, that is not a local trip, is it? That, that is a much more engaged thing. Um, that's more akin to our sort of residential spaces. But, you know, if, you, if it's getting in the bus, going half an hour, an hour down the, to do an, act, to an activity centre or to, to do something, then, um, then that's fine. And, uh, you know, it's about keeping it, keeping it reasonable and, and measured. And uh, we're tr again, we trust the youth sector. We trust youth colleagues on the call to know, you know, what is local, what is reasonable. And again, I, I, I reiterate this point. Do you need to do the activity? And, and again, from, a, from, a, from an, an education perspective, the youth sector largely exists to educate in young people. Yes, it's to have a lot of fun, but we're there to develop young people into, you know, from children into adults and help them through that journey. And being really careful and clear that the, 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 the reason we're doing this activity, this trip, is because I can't achieve this same outcome by doing it at at base doing our normal activities and if that's the case then go and do your trip and then please do but if you can achieve the same goal the same outcome in your local park rather than needing to go uh, an hour away in a bus then 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 you should be doing that okay thanks Lee and just on the bus uh, somebody had been asking about um, rules and regulations if you are transporting young people so should they be just one on a seat as opposed to doubling up is it again sensible provision uh, sensible steps to, to limit social or to extend social distancing. Yeah, I'm sure you didn't mean this, but you should only ever have one person per seat. Um, you know, not doubling up on seats. But, um, <laughs> Double seats. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. But um, yeah, so no, I mean, you can fill every seat in the bus. Best practice would be have space between, you know, a, a space, a seat empty in between people. But, um, you know, we, we've got budgets and costs and, you know, we've, we've only got the certain vehicle access that we've got. So you can use every seat. That's absolutely fine. Make sure everyone's got face coverings on, hand hygiene, oh, crack the windows a little bit, get good airflow in the bus, because that way, you know, the var if, it, if it's in the air, it blows out quickly. Good ventilation, face coverings, hand hygiene, spread out if you can, but we totally accept that that's not practical half the time. Uh, so you can use every seat. Um, and yeah, just follow those basic guidelines and you'll be fine. Um, Okay. Um, Lee, we're still having some questions around um, the fact that it's saying that the it, it's, we're still recommending maximum 15 for indoor groups, but can you just clarify that again for us? The, max, the indoor group bit is only for over 18 year olds. So under 18 year olds, there's no indoor group maximum size. It could be as big as you like, as long as you've got space to spread out. The, uh, the, the 15 plus bit is purely for over 18s. Okay, I'm just um, reading them as they're coming in thick and fast here, Lee. So, um, no, that's fine. The one here, regarding over 18s working in the rule of six, can they work in bubbles of six indoors and outdoors? So if it's part of a, if you've got over 18s and it's part of a structured activity, so you're running a youth project, you know, a drop-in LGBT programme or something, 
um, or sorry, not drop in because that wouldn't be allowed. But if you've got an LGBT program and you invited a group of 15 young people to come along, you then don't have to put them in groups of six. They can be a group of 15 for the purpose of your activity. The rule of six applies in the community. Uh, so if you're out and about in the park um, and doing activities, um, then the rule of six may apply. But again, if you're taking your structured, organised program and you're just doing it outside in the local park you are quite you can stay as a group of 15 plus your staff etc and the rule of six doesn't apply to you the rule of six applies to ad hoc unstructured youth activity so the, the, the probably the best example would be um you know I, when i used to do detached youth work we'd just patrol, walk around the local, you know, local community and we'd see who we'd bump into and, and if we bumped into a group of young people it was more than six then then we should you know we should be educating young people that they need to be operating in the rule of six um and, and because it's not a structured activity we we might have planned to go and do it but it's not what we're you know young people we're in their space not our space if that makes sense so um supporting young people is fine but the rule of six applies to unscheduled unplanned activity but if it's planned, if it's if what you're regularly planning to do, if you have a session plan, if you've got your risk assessment behind it, if you've had a briefing before you go out to do, to do whatever you're going to do, then, then that is an organised youth sector activity and the rule of six wouldn't apply. But over 18s, groups of 15 maximum, um, under 18s, no, there's no limitation on size. Okay, thank you. Uh, and one uh, specific question here. If young people do not need to be static to one place, how does this work with track and trace? Previously, when they were in bubbles, the whole bubble isolated, which was simpler. Can you advise, please? Yeah, and it's, it's you know, as the world un unlocks and it gets looser, th these are things that are going to become greyer in, in uh, greyer areas for us. So uh, you should be trying to keep those young people in consistent bubbles by, by their school groups it, when they come to your activities. But it's not always practical. I mean, you know, often, you know, I've run youth projects where six or seven different secondary schools, young people came from six, seven different places. So, you know, it's not practical to keep them in this group, the same group they are by day. Uh, and, and you're welcome to mix them up if you need to, but then try and keep them in consistent groups week to week to week if you can. That's that's best practice. Um, but, but you know, it's about managing, practically managing the realities of, you know, young people being able to now under 18s they can just turn up and drop in they don't have to be pre-invited they don't have to be booked in um so you don't know who's going to come and therefore you're going to have to do your best to try and put them into subgroups if you need to uh, or not if you can't manage that and, and again if you can't then that's absolutely fine the, the, you're within the rules you're within the guidelines um if 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 a young person uh, becomes unwell say at school but they came to youth club last night then they should be informing you um, or test and trace hopefully would inform you if necessary and then you would need to inform everybody you attended but again now it would be getting lateral community testing in place so you go and get a test if you're negative carry on if you've got a if it comes back negative uh, positive well then follow the standard rules of you know isolation etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, there's no need for everybody to isolate because there's such good testing available now through these sort of not you know to put the swab up your nose and then you can do the, the test kits at home just on testing um the government said this week that from next week there will be uh, free community testing available. So in your local area, there will be a, a lateral flow community testing centre and you can just go along and ask them for a, a, a box and they'll give you a box of seven tests. So families can go and do this. Um, we've got one around the corner from where we live here. Uh, and so, you you know, if you've got a problem, everybody can go to the centre, get a, get a test. You can either go in and be tested or you can take the test home. And, and if it comes back positive and is a problem, well then, you know, everyone needs to do the responsible thing and isolate um but at least you can now have got access to that testing at such easy way of doing it you can do it when you, you can get the tests when you need them you can go and do it also the other thing around testing is for employers who've got more than 10 staff you can go on the gov.uk website and register and you, they will actually post them to you you can get free free tests sent straight to your organization um, it is just for your staff but that's one that's one way you can get access to testing kits as well so with with the enhanced access to testing the speed of those tests being sort of 15 to 30 minutes we can be a lot more agile as a sector because we know we can if necessary we can test our way around our group and our our, our volunteers and staff if we felt there might be a problem uh, and we can address it if there is Thank you, Lee. Uh, and there's also uh, just some clarification about will private dwellings be allowed to be used as venues for youth activities from step three, do we know? Yeah, so the, the use of uh, um, private dwellings is 
is, is, is a tricky one. So, you know, the NYA would not uh, recognise the use of someone's personal home, uh, workers' home or whatever, for under any circumstances for the delivery of youth sector activity. There, there might be, I know the faith sector that has sort of uh, prayer groups and things and, and things like that. And, and we will talk further when, when that gets more realistic to, with um, sort of faith bodies around and how to handle and manage that. But at the moment, no, the, the use of uh, personal uh, private dwellings of, young, uh, of, of staff and volunteers is, is unacceptable. Um, you can now do a home visit. So you, the only time you can go into a private dwelling is if it's a young person's home. But you need to make sure that it's supervised so that their parents are around or you've got two staff you know i mean i think their parents should always be around in some respects depends on their age um and and multiple staff if necessary so you can go and talk to the young person in the back garden you can go and have a chat with them on their sofa um but you you've got to be really really rigorous around your safeguarding and the multiple people you know someone else knows you're going to do that activity you clock in you clock out uh, you know really really rigorous on on your risk assessments Okay. Um, also, uh, just a few around organised sportly and just clarification about whose guidelines should be followed. So if you've got over 18s and they're, and they're doing that, should it be our guidelines? Should it be specific bodies guidelines? So it depends. And I've said this many times. If, if it's a community football club that runs a youth project or you know, a community football group, a youth group, then uh, then you might, it might be appropriate for that football club to follow the FA's guidance around uh, community sport. Um, if it's a youth project that just does football for a part of its activity, then you need to be following the NYA's guidance. You can't pick and choose, colleagues. So you've got to either work, you're either in the youth sector and you've been in this journey with us since the start, and you need to be following youth sector guidance, or you're a sports association membership group, you know, you're a member of the FA or a, another sporting association, and then you could follow their guidance. But, you, you know, that's, that's got to be really clear. Um, and we know that often within youth groups we have other young leaders wanting to to come in and, and work with other young people. What, what's the view through the guidance of encouraging that or enabling that during this period? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's amazing. We love young people being brought on and developed as junior leaders or you know future leaders of the sector. So um, it's absolutely fine. Um, and, and again, it slightly depends on their journey. So if they've just started and they're still a young person but they're taking on a few responsibilities, um, then then they're still a participant, and and I would treat them as a young person who's participating. If if they've done the ba your sort of your basic training, and I think the key thing for us is if they're registered as a volunteer with you. Uh, you know they filled in a form and you've got them registered well then you can class them as a member of staff um and they can they can be additional to your uh, your groups so you know i would absolutely encourage youth boys junior leaders all day long and it's absolutely fine to do that okay um and there is just um a clarification just following up from the gardens lee if it's um part of a vicarage or a rectory sort of gardens attached to those sort of dwellings where well, we know that maybe guiding and scouting of, of often used for tents etc is that possible that might be possible but i would be really careful that you risk assess that that it's it's not the dwelling of somebody who's attending uh it's not a per the, the person someone's personal home who's in your group so if you i mean yes there are some huge vicarages with whopping great gardens and if you're just using the corner of one to do an activity uh, that could be acceptable uh but be very very rigorous on your safeguarding and your risk assessments um you know i've been watching the uh, the historical sexual abuse inquiry and some of the stuff that's been you know they've been examining and there is practice that is that that might seem very ordinary to us but actually could be putting workers and young people at, at unnecessary risk and it's an area the way could not and would not condone so <clears throat> please you know we we do not recommend the use of uh private dwellings under any circumstances um you know, a large Abbey Hawk, you know, vicarage field or something would be might be possible, but I'd be very careful. Okay. Um, see what else has come through. Um, somebody's asking. Uh, obviously, we talked about the uh, the mini bus earlier, but are there any guidelines in relation to transporting young people in a car? Yeah, so um, in, in the new guidance document that's been released um, now, um, we, we, the same, same applies to cars. So you can, you know, you, know, you can take on people in a private car, um, but the, again, hand sanitizing, face covering, crack the window a little bit to get some ventilation if you can. Um, but your use of cars is fine. Make sure you're insured if it's a private car because there are different, you know, you've got to make sure you've got the right type of insurance, um, but it is possible. Um, again, safeguarding measures, 
make sure you've got enough to at least two members of staff in the vehicle i would always put the young person in the back if you can think those things through carefully but you know yeah that's fine you can use a car taxis minibuses public transport all of that and, and we've covered that in our new guidance version amanda we've we're nearly at the end of our session so we could take one more question well actually this is probably a good question which is well, um can you confirm is the new guidance on the website yet being loaded up or people have just to ask a, a question around um, if the new guidance is already on the website. Yeah, so um, yeah, we'll finish that one. That's a great question to finish with. So yeah, I mean, I, as I understand it, um, it was all loaded up, ready to go. When we started the webinar, Laura in the background was going to activate it. I'm sure she's done so. I'm not, I've not seen any messages on our channel that says it hasn't happened. Uh, no, uh, yeah, Alex has just confirmed it's all up and running. So it's on the website. If anyone needs it, it's on there. You can go and download it. While you're there, do that census check and make sure you're pre-registered for the census. That would be awesome as well. Um, so yeah, huge thanks to Amanda for joining us and taking our questions. Uh, we're with you every step of the way on this. And as things ad adapt and evolve, we will continue to support the sector and we will continue to uh, run these webinars and keep our guidance up to date. Use the guidance inbox if it's useful. If you've got, if you're confused or we've, your, your situation is quite specific, then uh, drop us a note to guidance at nya.org.uk and uh, we, we'll get back to you within 48 hours as best we can. Um, look, the youth sector is absolutely amazing and we are really, really proud of everything you're doing. The responsibility level we're taking is huge and we're, you know, well noted. And uh, so, so thanks for doing everything you're doing for young people. Thank you for continued support and following our guidance. It really matters. And it shows the sector is incredibly responsible uh, and that's really important. So thanks for being awesome for young people and uh, have a great afternoon and uh, we'll be back when there's more to say next. Take care. Goodbye.